This is going to be a special episode of the Smoke-Filled Room, simply because we usually record these on Thursdays, and yet on Thursday, I'm going to be in the hospital with my wife for the birth of our first child, our son, uh, and I couldn't be more excited for it. So obviously that's a bit more important to me than recording a political podcast. So I'm going to do that, uh, and my team's going to carry things forward. So you're going to see the two videos we recorded on Tuesday night talking about the Boss Bailey race, uh, Boss Bailey race with Michael Butler, who's actually on location at the Mike Boss victory, victory celebration. We then did a recap, me, Chris, and Michael just talking about election night. Uh, and then Chris and Michael and some other people who've been on our team over the years are going to be talking uh, after that about just what else has happened throughout the course of the week. I'm sure there'll be updates on the Cook County State's Attorney's race. Uh, there'll be updates maybe on the Adam Niemerg write-in race. So they'll share with you all the rest of that. But I'm going to be busy. To those who have sent supportive uh, texts and emails, uh, and even we had a few people who watched this who actually sent a gift or two to my wife, uh, really, really kind of you. Thank you so much. The outpouring of love and support has really meant the world to us. Uh, my wife and I have been trying for a very long time. I've been wanted to be a dad for 20 years. Uh, we've been trying for over seven years. We've been IVF for over three years. We've had miscarriages. We've had problems. Uh, my wife has really struggled with this. I've really struggled with this. And so just the love and support from everybody has really meant the world to me. We'll share thoughts. We'll share photos because we're really excited to uh, for the birth of our son. In the meantime, we'll make sure that you're still getting your weekly updates from SFR. Don't worry. Those will continue. I just may not be on a couple episodes here as I get it to uh, spend every waking moment with my son. But I promise I'll be back. I'm sure some of you won't mind having a break from me. In the meantime, connect with me on social media. If you're not already, we'll share, I'm sure, way too many photos of our boy, uh, including the name, which I'm very excitedly holding on to, but we'll, uh, we'll announce that when he's born. So thanks again for sticking with us. Enjoy the next couple of videos here that will make up this week's SFR. And uh, next time I see you all, I'll be a daddy. All right, IL-12 is called. Boss declared victory just a few minutes ago. Darren Bailey conceded. I'm with Michael Butler. He's at Mike Boss election night celebration. Michael, show us uh, show us the room. I heard that Boss got uh, here yeah. now. Let's see if you can see back here. There's a lot of people over here, and uh, the press and there's the press and stuff's in the other room. So they're they're interviewing Congressman Boss right now and kind of getting a statement now that. The race has been called. So uh, what's what's uh, the mood rowdier there? over there? What's the Do mood? What? At, what's the mood at the party? Uh, excited! Everybody's excited and happy and relieved. I mean, that's a big thing because obviously this was kind of a nail biter. We didn't. I mean, we had some polling that showed you know Mike up, but we didn't really know what the final result was going to be because turnout was a big factor in this race for sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. I mean, what we were reporting all day is that turnout was abysmal. And so the question is, you just don't know what that's going to do to an election. With low turnout, it's anything can happen because a small group of voters can w wildly swing an election. So that's what yeah. just had everybody scared today, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, Bailey supporters seem to have a lot of motivation and energy behind them. So that was kind of a wild card. Um, we didn't really know how that was going to play out, but obviously... Uh, Mike supporters showed up in droves. So, you know, 6,000 more than Bailey. So that was good. Yeah. I mean, we got a six point, six point lead right now. More votes are still going to come in. So who knows where this thing ends up? Uh, what's ironic is we said, that's what we said in our last SFR, the last couple SFRs. Didn't we say like the over under is right around that number, right around six. Yeah. So um, Absolutely. kind of ironic. It probably gets a little all the way through. Yeah. I mean, and that was the thing. So I talked on uh, Fingston's podcast earlier tonight about what this race was. And basically the strategy the whole time for Boss was hold your lead and keep Bailey down. Yeah. Like that's been the whole race. It's been a unique strategy here of just keep your lead, yeah, keep sure, your lead, sure. keep your lead. And it looks like that worked. Yeah, absolutely. They maintained their lead and all the way through the end, um, you know, I think we talked about, you know, on previous podcasts and stuff that it didn't seem like there was a lot of undecideds that both camps were kind of like maintaining. Um, but Mike was able to get some of those undecideds, you know, as the campaign went on because he had the resources to do that. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, what are you hearing from Bailey people on, on you know, it seems like it was the fact that Bailey has conceded the race is over. What are, the, what are you hearing from your contacts on that side? Uh, I think there's some relief because, you know, there had been kind of some crazy antics from that side. And there's some hope that maybe that can kind of be put to rest. I mean, those antics kind of materialized in some other races throughout the state. Um, and those candidates also weren't successful. So, 
there's kind of a little bit of hope that maybe we'll kind of shift things in the right direction, be a little more behaved moving forward. Michael, I mean, listen, you look at, um, it seems like all the incumbents pretty much won, right? So if you beyond even Boston, you've got all these state ledge races where it looks like all the incumbents pulled it off. So it just, it seems like this was the last six, nine months of our lives. It was all just a bunch of wasted time, wasted money, because we're, we're basically right where we started uh, a year ago, right? Well, I would say, I think a lot of people took a gamble. Like they, they thought that maybe there would be some anti-incumbent sentiment right now and you see the results from tonight and there wasn't like people back the incumbents across the board even different styles of incumbents right like you have terry bryant and dave Saverin, they won in landslides but so did blame will Howard. so a lot of people in southern illinois are happy with who they're currently being represented by and they weren't looking for a change but that's very different from you know two years ago whenever there was kind of an anti-establishment mindset that prevailed and a lot of those kind of candidates won those primaries. So that's a fair know, point. No, I will say it it was possible to win as challengers in primaries this year because we had some clients down by you that won. And we'll talk about that uh, very, very soon in an SFR or something else, not here in this video. But it certainly was possible yeah. to win in this primary because we did it. But you see a lot of these races we're talking about, the, uh, the incumbents pulled it out. And like you've got right there with Boston, it seems like everyone's pretty excited there. You got to keep muting, huh? <laughs> yeah, they're coming over here and bringing me beers. So, you know, we're doing it's good. It's time to celebrate, buddy. Absolutely. Let me ask you about this. What does this mean for Darren Bailey? I mean, he put out a statement in his uh, or in his speech. He blamed, I don't know if you saw this yet, he blamed churches. He said the reason why he lost is all because of churches, which I'll be honest, I've had a few drinks. I've kind of gone off on him on Twitter about this because last time he lost, it was all the fa failure of weak need Republicans. And now it's all the failure oh, it's of always churches. Gonna... It's always at, at what someone... point does Darren Bailey take responsibility for his own losses? Oh, never, never. I mean, he's going to continue to blame anybody but himself because that's what he's done. You know, that's what he did last cycle. That's what he's doing now. It's kind of to be expected. Yeah. Yeah. Can I get on there? You want to get on here? We got some special guests coming in, I guess. All right. Uh -oh. uh, Kyle Sutcher. Big night for governing conservatives in Southern Illinois, Colin. There you go, buddy. How you doing? Congrats on the win. Thank you very, very much. Big night. So uh, I hear I, I hear Boss only gets about five minutes to celebrate because he's got to get on a red eye to D.C. to get back to, get back to oh, yeah. I think they already left. They went out the door. D.C. tomorrow. Because Mike does his job. Mike <laughs> goes to D.C. and does his job. That's why. Amen. Um, see you, Colin. Dude, buddy. Michael, anything else you want to share about the race? I mean, I think a lot of people are just happy that it's finally over and we can kind of move on to the general election and let's uh, elect more Republicans throughout this entire state. Yeah, well, you're not lying, man. The real uh, the real fight begins tonight and we got our uh, a tall task ahead of us. But the good news is we got Mike Boss still in our congressional delegation for, for at least another two years. So congrats Absolutely. on the win, buddy. And uh, we'll talk more about some of the other races later. All right. Sounds good. Good talking to you. The poll results are in and most races are final. So I've got Core Strategies political experts, Chris and Michael, here to talk about what just happened. There's, it looks like at least one race that we won't know the official results for for a while, another race that may trickle into the next couple of days. So not everything's official just yet, but I want to get some hot takes here. So uh, Michael, I already just did a video with you on Boss Bailey. So Chris, why don't yeah. we start with you? Uh, overall, what are your thoughts from election day and these election results? Well, there's a couple of thoughts I have. The first one is that this seems to be the year of the incumbent. Um, voters turning out in this primary weren't very progressive. They weren't very anti-establishment. There wasn't really a race at the top of the ticket for president um, in either party, um, particularly the Democratic Party. But either way, this was a year of the incumbent. Um, conservative Southern Illinois uh, state representatives did very well, and liberal state representatives in Cook County um, and the suburbs for the Democratic Party also did very well. Um, there wasn't really a lot of well-funded opposition on any side um, of the equation, so that all obviously helped. But even well-funded opposition downstate absolutely got smoked. I mean, we're looking at Matt Hall struggling to break 10% versus Will Howe. So certainly the year of the incumbent, and it's also the year where it seems that money does move votes in politics. I mean, if you had the money advantage in a lot of these um, primaries, you probably won. Yeah, well, and certainly we got to talk about turnout. But before we do that, Michael, what are your overall thoughts on what just happened? Yeah, I would uh, agree with what Chris had to say. It seems like, you know, people are happy with, you know, Republican primary voters are happy with who they're currently being represented by, and they weren't looking to really, like, shake things up this cycle, which is kind of a change from 
the um, the governor's election last cycle where they were kind of looking for more of those like dynamic, like let's stir it up kind of folks. Um, but obviously turnout had a ma played a major factor in that as well. Like there wasn't, you know, a presidential race really driving turnout. It was all the local stuff. So people could kind of keep the races more localized, which I think is, you know, produces a better result. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about that turnout. So turnout was abysmal. There's no other way to put it. Uh, and frankly, just interest in this election was abysmal. You had nobody engaging. You had the fewest candidates we've seen in a very, very long time for a presidential election year. It just seems like nobody, I'll just say it, nobody gives a shit about this election, which can't be a good thing. I mean, to me, that's the takeaway right now from this election. And it's a disheartening one that more people don't care, didn't care to run. More people didn't care to vote. There's a lot of big issues, a lot of big things going on in our state and country. And it doesn't seem like that's enough to get people to care. What do you guys think about that? I mean, I kind of wish we could have seen some more polling for some of these like other races, like obviously like you, we can kind of use like the boss race kind of anecdotally in Southern Illinois. But, you know, we didn't see like, you know, we did a core strategies. We did a poll like at the beginning of the cycle. And then there was another poll that was done about a week and a half ago. And the margins were the same. Right. There wasn't really significant movement when you pulled the electorate over the course of all that time, regardless of, you know, how many Facebook posts and mailers and TV ads, et cetera, it just stayed at that. Like Mike boss is out by six points. Um, and I think we saw that in a lot of other races as well. If they had been polled, it probably would have been, you know, kind of a similar trajectory that a lot of people went into this primary with their mind made up and they didn't really change it. Yeah. Chris, what do you think? From my perspective, it doesn't seem like there was a there was like a big issue in a lot of these races that would have turned people out to vote or vote for uh, a candidate other than the incumbent. There were some very local issues that were at play here, but most of the issues that um, opposition candidates were trying to present were manufactured. Um, you know, we talked about you know the the Hall Wilhauer race. I mean, Hall really didn't have a major issue he could go after with with, with Wilhauer, and it obviously showed. Um, even Bailey, he was trying. And to artificially create um, the you know the amnesty stuff and some of the boss other votes that weren't deemed conservative enough, but it wasn't really anything concrete. Usually, if you want to drive people to the polls or get people energized about an issue, it's got to be black or white. This is one side, and this is the side the other side, my opponent did, and this is why you need to vote for me. There really wasn't that much going on this election. Democrats had to navigate around the Gaza issue a little bit, but there wasn't enough well-funded opposition at the congressional level to actually make any sort of impact. So there was a money advantage with incumbency, and there wasn't a real issue to go against them um, when it came to actual messaging. Well, do you guys see this carrying to November? I mean, looking at the November election, you've got a top of the ticket uh, for president where voters are not overly excited about either of these two candidates, especially not independent, moderate swing voters. Um, neither of the presidential candidates excite them. So if we see this low of interest in the Democratic and Republican primaries, I would imagine that means the general election you know, could be extremely low voter participation as well. What do you think? I think we're seeing a lot of voter apathy right now, and I think that will carry over to the general election. I think it'll go down a little bit because people still feel like the need to be involved in presidential politics, no matter how terrible either of the nominees are, in this case, both of them perhaps. Um, so I think a little bit of the apathy will go away once we get to a more black and white Republican versus Democrat dynamic. But still, I, I think voters right now are frustrated. The country seems to be going in the wrong direction. I mean, every poll will tell you that most people indicate they think this country is not doing well right now or the state's not doing well right now, um, though the state polling is moving in the opposite direction, of course. But either way, I mean, I think some of it will go away, but voters are apathetic right now. And there really needs to be some strong messaging by both parties to make people actually care and feel like their vote matters and that they can make a difference. Yeah. Michael, what do you think? What do you think November is going to look like? I think it'll be imp like improved turnout from, you know, what we saw in this primary, just because we had a lot of very weak challengers. And I think a lot of people saw it as, hey, a lot of these races were over before they even started. Um, and also how nasty it got. I think that turned a lot of people off. Some of these races ended up being very divisive and negative. Um, so I think people will show up for the the presidential more so than they did for this one for sure i mean they have to considering they have to. that was so low well, here yeah, but i mean you typically see 70 plus percent turnout in a presidential election and i don't i don't know that we're gonna i don't think it'll be that in margins no it won't be 
70 percent probably yeah which i mean it's going to be a factor i I don't know what who benefits from that factor we're gonna have to do a lot of analysis on our sfrs in the coming weeks and months to figure that out but it's certainly going to be a big factor come november when you look at you know turnout's not going to look like it typically looks every four years and everyone's gonna have to take that into account yeah all right, we've got a couple outstanding races, one in each of your regions. So let's talk about them. Michael, I'll stick with you. You know, we've talked about the results in all these races, but there's one race we have no information on. That's 102. That's Niemerg against Ackland, the write-in race. Um, typically, you'll see some results from that as the counties start to release those numbers in the one or two days after Election Day. But uh, we've had some people that have reported that maybe some of these counties are going to wait the full two weeks until they release their full results, which means we won't know the results for HD 102's primary for maybe two weeks. You hearing anything about that? The word kind of on the ground is it seems like there's basically like two options here. Either one, like Adam Niemerg will have enough write-in votes and be the state rep candidate, or neither of the candidates will have enough write-in votes and this will go you know, end of the summer, whenever the candidate, whenever the parties can slate somebody. Um, like, it just doesn't seem like Ackland got the traction that people were expecting. They were kind of late to the game. Um, they kind of got, were off to a slow start. And, you know, we talked, I think, last week about some of the messaging that they were using, and it just didn't seem to be working. Like, they were both driving each other's name ID up in a write-in campaign whenever they should have been focused on, you know, getting people to write them in. Yeah, so. I mean, the, the strategy there was not great at all. I mean, I don't anticipate Ackland's going to pull it off, which I've been saying for a while. Just yeah. like, by the way, everyone who kept telling us, Hall's going to win, Hall's going to win, Hall's going to win. And then, of course, <laughs> Will Howard won 80-20. I mean, they're just, yeah. they're, logically, we talked about this six, nine months ago. I mean, how many SFR episodes have we done since then? But we've been consistent about it, that if you can't, if you don't have, as Chris said at the beginning, if you don't have an issue to run on, if you can't run to the right in a primary that, or to the left in the in, in the primary on the Democratic side against an incumbent, you're not going to win. And there's no space to Nemerge's right. There's no space to Will Howard's right. There's no space even in... Uh, and Bryant's right or Severin's right. I mean, there's a reason why these incumbents are all winning. Uh, I don't yeah. know that that changes with Nemer Gacklin. Right. Chris, for you, the race that's going to drag on for at least a couple of days is Cook County State's attorney. This thing's down as of the time that we're recording this, uh, which is Tuesday night. This thing's down to about a 2% race. Uh, this thing's going to be neck and neck, isn't it? Yeah, the mor- the morning viewer of this will have a better idea of where this race is at than I do. But as of my last math uh, mathematical calculation, Burke's sitting at 51.12% of the vote, which the fact that she is even in this position is impressive because Vallis wasn't in this position this long on his election night. Now, Burke has an advantage in that she's dealing with suburban votes. But right. I was Burke, just going to say, Vallis wasn't in this position, but Vallis only got to run on the city of Chicago. So I don't know if that's apples to apples. True, but it's, it's a similar dynamic in terms of, in terms of their opponents and their candidacies. Um Burke, the, the, these returns tell me that Burke's campaign actually worked, that their abortion first messaging and ever, all, all the money they spent actually moved the needle with voters. The fact that they're within a couple points in the city of Chicago at all tells me that they have improved significantly with African-American voters con- term, con- compared to Vals. So, Chris, and, it, it seems like from the last couple of times we've talked about this race, it seems like they made a trade-off. Let's do better in the city, but maybe not as well in the suburbs. And I think you're seeing that in the results where their suburban numbers are not as strong as they should be and could be, but their Chicago numbers are much better than I think anticipated. And so maybe it's going to work. We're going to know in the coming days, maybe it will work. I still think there were more votes to be had in the suburbs. And so I still think it was the wrong strategy. However, I think we do need to give credit that they clearly had a path that they wanted to track, um, that they wanted to follow. They had a strategy, they ran it. And to some degree it's worked. Does it work enough to get a win? We're going to find out. Um, but credit where credit is due, right? Right. And I would agree with that sentiment. Based on what the numbers I'm looking at right now, the likelihood is that Burke is probably going to get below 51% by the end of tonight, going to mail-in ballots as the underdog versus Harris, who's probably who's going to be favored with mail-in ballots. That being said, um, Burke had a lane. She ran with it. She probably had an added advantage in the city of Chicago that Brandon Johnson is so terrible now with that and being said she probably would have done better in the city if she actually tried tying harris to brandon johnson right their campaign never the bring chicago home referendum proves that right 
Exactly. But their campaign never actually did that. And their campaign didn't devote significant resources into the suburbs. And once we have precinct results for the suburbs in about two weeks, when Cook County finally gives it to us, um, you're probably going to see that Burke is probably underperforming where she needs to be in my neck of the woods and probably even in your neck of the woods, Colin. Um, we'll know Chicago tonight, so we'll have a better understanding. But um, Burke probably would have, if Burke would have ran, ran a better, an actual field program, I would be saying Burke's at 53% and that she's pretty much a shoe in right. to beat the mail in ballots. But right now she's sitting at 51.12. And I don't think, she, I mean, the, the optimist that's deep within my soul, you know, the small optimist tells me, I think Burke does have a chance because she's over 51. But the practical person in me says, I don't think so. Nothing ever goes right for Chris. I mean, you did eat that optimist a very long time ago, so they, they don't exist anymore. I oh, mean, listen, I, I think vote by mail ballots, you've got to assume a 2% swing for Harris probably is is my guess. So if, I mean, if Burks right now is up barely over 2%. This thing could come down to the slimmest, absolute slimmest. Well, at this point, I'd say it is coming down to the absolute slimmest of margins. Uh, so uh, this thing could drag on for another week plus as they look at more of these vote write-in votes. Keep in mind, the city of Chicago did announce that they're not counting the write-in votes. I keep saying write-in, the vote by mail ballot votes that came in today on election day. So there's going to be a big drop tomorrow on um, these these vote by mail ballots because they did not count the ones that arrived today, let alone the, the ones that are going to arrive in the coming days. So there's a lot of votes that are, are still to be counted. And the assumption is based on who was backing which candidates that uh, Harris is going to do very well with those vote by mail ballots. And I would agree. But there, again, there's a, there are a couple lanes where Burke could have just ended this, this race already. Okay. We're looking at drastically low Latino turnout. Same problem that Vallis had in the, in the mayoral election. And Burke probably is doing very well with Latinos right now, but they frankly did not even show up to vote. It doesn't even look like Chewy Garcia's primary challenge from Ray Lopez is even moving the needle and a lot of these yeah. city wards are even sub Latino suburbs. Yeah, I mean, the, so, the Supreme Court race certainly didn't do it. And you're you're also looking at the same thing with Iris Martinez. Iris Martinez is being smoked for clerk at a circuit court, and she's basically getting the same margin she did four years ago, which is about 30 33% that she won with. But Latinos just didn't show up this year, and it's the Burke's disadvantage. Now, she didn't have any Latino outreach to begin with, same Vallis, but Vallis had in his race. But... I, I, I'm thankful that it's at least this close that we're even able to talk about it because I was coming into election night expecting Harris to be up like four and this race would be already over and I would be yelling at the camera right now. Right now, there's still some, you know, there's still some delusional optimism coming out of Chris Jakowiak. So I'm not yelling at the camera and I'm just hoping to God this goes properly. Yeah. Well, listen, I mean, for as a Cook County resident like you, I certainly want it to be Burke. Um, so th that's the fingers crossed scenario here. But as a Republican who likes to win elections in Cook County, I wouldn't mind Clayton Harris. So we'll see. I will give him credit, though. I mean, there were more votes in Chicago than there were in Cook County for this race. So running a, a Chicago focused race uh, certainly wasn't uh, wasn't a bad path to take. We'll find out if it was enough to get a win. Uh, all right. Let's let's close with this. Who are the biggest losers? Uh, I got to imagine Brandon Johnson. I mean, uh, progressive Twitter is absolutely ripping into Brandon Johnson. So I think we got to start there. I mean, with the bring Chicago home referendum failing and failing pretty significantly when uh, the progressive tax did so well in the city of Chicago, this is absolutely a referendum on Johnson. Uh, and his his poll numbers are an absolute tank for anything that's tied to it. Uh, what do you uh, what do you think, Chris? You know, with, with 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 bring Chicago home, they ha the progressives had the momentum going into election day because they got kicked off the ballot, but they were reinstated, and it didn't seem like the opposition really wanted to you know fight them on that issue, so they just kind of let it stay on the ballot. And I expected bring Chicago home to come through because of that, because it didn't really seem like there was a concerted effort against it. There were ads and everything, but they weren't as significant as the bring Chicago home ads were. I was getting those ads every day. I don't even live in the city of Chicago. I'm getting those ads on, on YouTube every single day about Bring Chicago Home. But I think what sunk Bring Chicago Home is two things. Number one, Johnson is hated. Like, he he is more hated than Lori Lightfoot was at this point in her administration. Like, nobody more, more hated Brandon, than she was at the end of her administration. Which is impressive. But nobody likes Brandon Johnson. So it's the same concept when you look back to the progressive text. Do you want, with the progressive taxes, should the rich pay more in taxes? The average voter probably says yes. Do you want the city, the state of Illinois to have more of your tax dollars? 
Also, no, I do not want that to happen. And it's the same concept in the city of Chicago. Should we raise taxes on people to fight homelessness? You know, maybe not the worst idea in the world. Do we want Brandon Johnson to have a blank check from the, the taxpayers of Chicago to do whatever he wants to end homelessness? No, nobody wants that in the city of Chicago right now. The other issue is, is the migrant crisis, because people in the back of their minds, they think of homeless. They're also thinking of migrants. And the migrant crisis, not a very popular issue in Chicago right now. Not a very popular thing to talk about. So in the back of their minds, people look at that long-winded spiel on the ballot, which most people didn't even think to read, and they're like, nah, this doesn't sound like a good idea. I don't want more migrants in my neighborhood. I don't want my tax dollar paying for migrants. That's another reason why this failed. It was a bad campaign on the progressive side. They didn't have good enough messaging for this, and Brandon Johnson just sucks, so of course it was going to fail. Well, listen, we saw that with progressive tax. It was a bad campaign by Pritzker and, and his team, one of the few times that they we could say that. Um, you see it here. I mean, the left is not showing us that they're incredible at winning elections. I think it just shows that we on the Republican side are really good at losing elections because we're looking up at this opposition showing how, how much they fail. If you can't win on a an issue like this that polls tremendously well in the city of Chicago, um, you can't win at all in these elections if we could put up decent challenges to them. I mean, this is heartening to me for general elections because I've got to imagine that you take out all the other factors. And as you said, not the worst thing to run on politically, this issue. But uh, I'll give the the conservative sides of this, like the, what is it, the realtors, the, the um, chambers all got involved against this in Chicago, and they hit the nail on the head, which was, do you trust Brandon Johnson with this money? That was clearly the winning message. And I don't know, uh, like you, I don't live in the city, so I didn't see all the back and forth, but I did see that uh, they were pushing that narrative pretty hard and clearly it worked. Yeah, but just like you just said about the strengths of progressive campaigns, this goes, I must touch on the state attorney's race very briefly here. This shows that, again, Burke could have had a much bigger margin if there was an actual better, real, solid campaign, but there wasn't, and that's why she's only speaking ahead right now. So the best lesson here is, same as the mayoral election, progressives aren't really that good at winning elections. It just so happens the moderates and the conservatives always find a way to shoot themselves in the foot every election. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, Michael, uh, I'll let you guys give me any other losers that you guys can think of, but I got to ask you, I mean, Bailey's obviously a big loser coming out of this. Uh, for those who haven't seen, he put out a statement and then uh, gave a speech, I believe, uh, where he basically put the blame on churches and it's all about churches not coming out and they're, they're the reason they're at fault. Uh, I just... There's a trend here. When Bailey lost his first race, it was weak need Republicans. Now when he lost this race, it's all because of the churches. There's no Darren Bailey taking a, any sort of blame for his own losses. Uh, and at some point, do people start to say, like, dude, stop blaming us for your own your own faults and failures here? I mean, the Illinois Freedom Caucus had an okay night. They won some races, didn't win all of them, but they won all their incumbent races. Uh, but Bailey's their biggest loss. Do they even say, all right, dude, go away. We're, we're actually doing better without you. <laughs> Maybe. I think that, you know, they, over the course of the past two elections, they burn a lot of bridges. I mean, and I think that came ultimately, that was one of the reasons that resulted in their like demise, this cycle um, on this Bailey race was that there are a lot of people that had, that had, were motivated to work against him, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, you make enemies and it comes back to haunt you. I mean, why do you think I've never run for office? I'm not an idiot. <laughs> right. So what's I mean, what's the path here for Bailey? I mean, he's he coming out of this. He does not look strong. He's going to blame it on Trump's endorsement. Um, but, you know, he was behind the whole race. Even before Trump yeah. endorsed, he was still solidly behind. It's going to be really hard for him to pin this on Trump to say that's why he lost. We can try to say that, but the data doesn't reflect that. Like we saw, you know, in that polling, the, the, the Trump endorsement didn't really move the needle that much you know maybe a point or two but there wasn't significant movement you know from the time that that endorsement happened until election day like the polling was consistent across the you know throughout the entire cycle so i think it's i mean he can try to make that case and i'm sure there'll be people that believe it but it's not based in reality and the data doesn't back that up yeah well those are my two biggest losers from the night you guys got anybody else you want to add to that list um, I want to have a I have a broad category here that's specific to Cook County. Uh, moderate Latinos. Um, we saw Burke, uh, not Burke. We saw like I'm calling him Burke, you know, it's a little Burke. Um, we saw Raymond Lopez challenge Chewy Garcia and get absolutely smoked. And Bur and Lopez also put up a number of different challengers to state representatives, both in and around that congressional district, who all got destroyed as well. Like nobody's even close. 
Um, you also look at people like George Cardenas, who lost his race for ward committeeman to Teresa Ma in the 12th ward. Um, Natalie Toro lost, not as much as people were thinking she was going to lose. People were talking about her coming in third. She's coming in a respectable second, but she loses. She loses in the 20th Senate District. Iris Martinez gets smoked for Cook County, you know, clerk of the circuit court. I mean, moderate Latinos just had a terrible, terrible night. They're either getting beaten by progressive Latinos or just beaten, get, being beaten by the establishment in general. And it, this has been a downward tr trend for more establishment, more, I shouldn't call them establishment, they're not establishment anymore, but more moderate conservative Latinos in Cook County where they've just been losing races ever since the HDO fell apart back in the 2000s. So, Chris, you know, you know what I'm going to say about this, right? Come there's on, an baby. opening. Come on, there, come on, you moderate Latinos who have no place right now in today's Democratic Party in Illinois. Come on home. Yeah, but Colin, you and I both know every time the Republican Party starts talking about how, you know, the, the black demographics coming home to the Republican Party this year or the Latinos are coming home to the Republican Party this year. It never actually happened. Listen, all I'm going to say is we are in the midst of a big data deep dive that will be released as part of our Empower platform. So another reason why you should be a subscriber to Empower to Win, uh, and I'm looking at the, the the numbers from Hispanics and these respondents, and yet again, I'm seeing lots of movement and openness to moderates, conservatives, Republicans, independents, pulling away from liberals and Democrats within the Latino subset, the Hispanic subset. Um, there, There is, and you're seeing it in election results too. Uh, I, I don't know if there's a space in today's Democratic Party, unless you're uh, a far left Latino, which many of them are not, uh, there just isn't a place in the Democratic Party for them. Our party, the Republican Party, has got to do a better job of making space for them under what should be a big, big tent. Uh, but they don't have a home right now, and we really, really should be doing everything we can to bring them to our side. Yeah, but that requires resources, something the only Republican Party doesn't have. Um, but again, there's there's been a failure with messaging to moderate Latinos. There's an opening there for Republicans to continue moving the needle in their direction. Um, but moderate Latinos lost tonight. Part of it, they have nothing to blame by themselves. There weren't a lot of strong campaigns going on in that neck of the woods. But still, there was they were losers tonight, and it just makes the Democratic Party go further and further to the left. Yeah, true. Michael, you got any other losers from tonight? You want to talk about Madison County? Get some big oh, wins yeah. from your buddy. Yeah, big win in Madison County with uh, Chris Slusser and Patrick McRae, um, you know, winning by 30, 40 points. I don't know. Not, what knocking off an incumbent board chairman the, who had been in office yeah. for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. So that was a big victory, a big victory for Madison County Republicans, a big victory for taxpayers because Kurt Prenzler's, you know, track record in that office was not good. So... I know you're you're all, always our optimist. So asking you to talk about losers is is probably not going to work out. So I'll, I'll keep prodding you and hoping. Uh, all right. I think it was a you know there was this kind of theme over the cycle. A lot of the campaigns ended up being very negative, very vindictive, and you know a lot of kind of like sketchy tactics. And a lot of the people that utilized those tactics weren't successful. So that was a good to see. You know, I mean, we saw some pretty nasty things from the Wesley Cash campaign. He got beat by 40 points. We saw like racist radio ads from the Angela Evans campaign. She got beat by 40 points. Um, it just didn't work out for him. Yeah. Yeah. Some some nasty things for sure. And, uh, you know, we're going to have <laughs> there's going to be a price to pay after today, I'm sure. But yeah. we, uh, it's March, right? We got some time to come together before the real fight begins as we look to, towards November. All right, any closing thoughts from you guys as we close this down on what was ultimately a fairly boring election night? <laughs> Bur Burke better be very thankful she's still up right now as of this recording or else I, this entire episode would have been me yelling at this camera. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll have more chances, don't worry. Oh, don't worry. Michael? I think overall, I think overall it was a good night for Republicans. There were a couple of races, obviously they were disappointing, but for the most part, the people that needed to win the, their primaries won their primaries. And now we can kind of move on to the general election where it really matters. Yeah. Yeah. We got a lot of work ahead of us for sure, especially with what's going to be a, a tough, tough sled with a top of the ticket. That's not going to help us in a lot of places. So yes. um, we've got a lot of work to do here to pull this thing off in November. All right, gentlemen, appreciate your time. Thanks for uh, keeping your, your uh, liquid intake to a minimum prior to recording. Yeah. So uh, I didn't, but that's okay. I uh, I've only said a few things that I may pay for later. Thanks guys. Yeah. We'll talk more there later. Go. Sounds good. See ya.
Welcome back to the smoke-filled room. I am not Colin Corbett. I am core strategies political expert Christopher Jakowiak. You may be wondering, has Chris finally snapped? Has he finally taken control of the company away from Colin in a fit of rage after Tuesday's election results? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Um, I am simply filling in for Colin this week as he is out. Um, we still wanted to bring you some smoke-filled room content in the reaction to the races that took place on Tuesday night. With me, as always, is Michael Butler, core strategies political expert. Say hello, Butler. Hello. <laughs> in addition... We have the founder and editor and chief executive officer of the Illinois podcast, one of the premier uh, political news destinations in the state of Illinois, Patrick Finkston, who is all decked out in his Illinois gear today, despite the uh, current results of the game as it's going who, on. Who decided to film this thing, tape this thing in the middle of an Illinois NCAA tournament game? Who do I have to slap for this? Well, unfortunately, Northwestern doesn't play until later, so John doesn't Who cares? Care. And, and Loyola didn't even make the tournament, so I don't care. So you're the odd man out here, Patrick, unfortunately. Story of my life, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and also with us is Jonathan Gieske, a political operator, so political operative associated with Operating Engineers Local 150 and a number of different other races. Jonathan, how are you doing today, my friend? Uh, I'm doing better than Darren Bailey because unlike him, I won my race on Tuesday. Well, speaking of which, we have to start with the IL-12 primary. Now, we've been talking about this race for God knows how long, ever since probably before Darren Bailey even announced. And the results are in, and Mike Boss is squeaked by a, with a narrow victory of about one and a half points over Darren Bailey. Uh, for Boss, it was just okay to win the race entirely, um, though still probably closer than he would have liked it. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on this race and how it turned out? I think ultimately it came out came down to turnout. Um, some of the counties that Mike needed high turnout in on that western side, they showed up, like Williamson County, where you know Mike got you know seventy percent of the vote. Um, Monroe County, St. Clair County had decent turnout, and that was enough to kind of put them over the top. Um, there were some counties that didn't turn out as well as we would have hoped, but a victory is a victory, right? <clears throat> guys are we not talking about how close this race still is sure I, it's it's i got the last county on thursday morning because of course they've never heard of the internet south of i-64 <laughs> and and it's a 1400 vote race yeah. it's i mean i i know the ap called it i know bailey conceded but and, and my guess is that that bailey and that that you know witch hunting crew of people who think all early and absentee votes are bad uh, aren't sending their mail their mail ballots in on march 19th but it's it is freakishly close remarkably close and and if if your team bossed you're thanking your lucky stars you got out of this alive because yep. if if trump's endorsement barely saved you holy cow and yeah, and, and i think i I think that's a, the other thing we need to talk about here is just how loony Republicans in Southern Illinois have become, because this is uh, Mike Bost is as conservative of a guy as you're going to find. He he you know, he rightly used the governing conservative term and and tried to make himself look like someone who can get stuff done and is chairman of a committee. He sure can. But that's not what voters want. That's not what Republican voters want. They want somebody who's going to light the whole place on fire. And that does that that those are Darren Bailey's voters now. Well, I would say one of the things that I kind of felt like looking back over the court, like since like the Trump endorsement on, you know, there was a couple of days after that Trump endorsement. A lot of people were saying, OK, this race is over. Mike's got it in the bag. He got Trump's endorsement. That's all that matters. You know, like we can kind of move on and focus on other things. I think that was a little bit of a mistake, obviously, with the results um, I per I live in the 12th district. I got polled probably at least seven or eight times. And you could tell by the polls that a lot of them were, you know, PACs or outside groups that were looking at this and determining kind of what are we going to do over the course of the, the last month of this race. I mean, I think a lot of them must have gotten results back that showed that Mike, you know, was up six, up seven, up eight, you know, like some of those external polls also showed. And they felt like, OK, well, we don't need to invest resources here. Um, because we didn't really see a lot of, I didn't get a lot of mail 
from packs. There were, you know, maybe two or three that sent me mail, um, but there wasn't this real big push from some of those external forces like we expected um, was going to happen. I mean, I think if some of that had materialized, this would have, you know, been a more comfortable margin for Mike. Heck, I got mail today, like a day after from, uh, day, or two days after the election from the credit union pack. It's like, well, that was Good great. Thanks effort. for sending it. Do what? Good job. Good effort. Send him mail. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Two John, days what late. You, John, what are your thoughts on this race? I know you spent some time down there in East Southern Illinois. Um, well, you know, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Um, and I think, you know, Mike won. That's the result that ultimately mattered at the end of the day. Um, you know, when you look at this map, it's pretty geographically based where, you know, Darren cleaned up on the east side. Mike cleaned up on the west side. Um, you know, and Darren's problem was there's just not a whole lot of population over where he's the strongest at and helped Mike prevail at the end of the day. Yeah, I think the geographical argument is going to reign supreme here. Uh, while I agree with Patrick that Southern Illinois certainly is very much moving towards the direction of they want the firebrand. They don't want the person who gets stuff done. Boss had an advantage that he was go there was more population in the western portion of the district where he was going to be very strong than there was going to be in the eastern portion of this district. Now, that being said, I said several weeks ago that if this race was even remotely close and Boss ends up pulling it out, I was going to call out Darren Bailey's campaign team for political malpractice because the fact of the matter is, because this race is so close, Darren Bailey could have easily still won this race, despite the Trump endorsement. The problem is, is that Darren Bailey ran a bad campaign. It really seemed like the first few months of this race was him trying to gain some tracks and trying to, you know, get Trump's endorsement, trying to get himself arrested by the attorney general for gun charges and not obeying the assault rifle ban, all these sorts of things. And it wasn't until the very end when he put in his own money, which he probably should have done at the beginning, and got got this race close. If Darren Bailey puts his money at the beginning, pledges to his donors that uh, here's my money, now will you give me yours, Darren Bailey probably wins this race. And even with the money he had, he still probably should have won this race if his campaign team ran a better race, focused on turning out their voter, voters instead of trying to make Mike Boss as some type of amnesty guy the entire campaign, which he wasn't. It still almost worked. But they should have won this race if they actually would have ran a better campaign. That's the unfortunate part. Of all this. Well, and I also think that there was a there was a sim a big mistake that they made this cycle that they that they also made during the governor's race that apparently they didn't learn from um, was they like got involved in all of these other races throughout the state and picked fights with people that they didn't need to. There was no justification for you know backing Wesley Cash over Terry Bryant. There was no justification for, you know, spending weeks and months like attacking Jason Plummer when he didn't even have an opponent in the primary whatsoever. Like they were out there making as many enemies as possible, thinking that that was going to get him over the finish line or something. Um, but obviously, you know, politics is addition. You need to try to bring in as many supporters as you can and not piss people off that have, you know, sway and influence within the district that you're running in. As it but seems we, to but be we know Darren Bailey's not going away, right? No. Uh, well, I mean, if you watch his Facebook Live from earlier today, he said that he was going to continue recruiting conservative candidates to run from everything from state rep to state senate to school board. Um, he's going to continue a restart cast that he kind of started last year, but never really put much content out. Um, and he's also encouraging people to kind of collect his Darren Bailey for Congress signs because he wants to put those in storage. So, um, you know, he's up to something and we'll see what he does. If he runs against Mike again, it wouldn't surprise me. Maybe Mary Miller, you know, decides this is her last term and he thinks he can go up there. I don't know. But yeah, we definitely haven't seen the last of him. That's for sure. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting. I think it's very likely he might try to run for U.S. Senate or something, maybe even governor again. We've not seen the last of Darren Bailey in this state. Um, you don't get within a point and a half of an incumbent congressman and just stop. I mean, while we all would like Darren Bailey to go away for a multitude of reasons, um, that's just simply not going to happen. So we're going to have to wait to see what Darren's next move is, but there will be a next move. I so just don't think that there was any, like, people thought, oh, if Mike wins, you know, by seven points or he wins by 10 points or something, that Darren Bailey will, you know, just go home and we won't hear from him again. But I don't think regardless of what the result was, um, that that was going to happen. I mean, you saw him lose the governor's race by 12 points, and he 
had, you know, a long list of excuses. It was everybody's fault but his own. And then now, to you know, even when he conceded a couple a couple of days ago, he said, you know, oh, the churches, it's their fault. They didn't get out to vote. We need to put some pressure on the pastors and those kind of things. So, you know, let, no let accountability. Me you, let me ask you guys this. Who today would be the Republican favorite for the nominee, nomination for governor? Darren. Darren Bailey. I mean, he's there's nobody else that, even on the he, radar right now. I mean, somebody could materialize, but at this moment, who's out there? Is Darren Bailey the standard bearer of the Illinois Republican Party now? In a way, yes. He still seems to have a very strong following even here in the suburbs. Yeah. I don't even know if, Dar if Darren LaHood managed to jump into the governor's race. He'd have the type of momentum to take out Darren. Now, Darren's problem might be he might not get the same amount of money he did last time because I don't know if Uline and Prof are going to come in to save him again. But the fact remains, J.B. Pritzker, <laughs> JB yeah. Pritzker saved him yeah. in the primary. <laughs> well, let's see if Darren. Let's see if JB's in the White House at that point. JB not be, might not be in the governor's mansion. He might be in Washington D.C. himself. So, I think he might have a monetary issue, but he's certainly going to be the front runner if he chooses to announce himself for governor in after November. And he, what well, I doing? think that I think that there. Okay, let's say Darren ran again for governor. If it's him versus like one other person, it's a two man race. Obviously, there's a there's a path for that other person. Mike showed that. But if it's you know like it was last time, and there's a field of you know five, six, seven people, like Darren's going to get that 30, 35 percent or whatever you know that he needs to make that happen. This is Trump's party. And and as long as Republicans in Illinois, especially south of I-80, continue to embrace the crazy, they are going to continue to embrace a proto-Trump like Darren Bailey. And and whether it's U.S. Senate, whether it's governor, whatever it might be, the 12th was a very fragmented election because of, of the built-in institutional support that, that Bost had. It was an uphill climb from the start for Bailey. Oh, a clean slate statewide with a guy who's been running nonstop since 2018. There's no way Bailey's not the favorite for a statewide race at this point. So moving, uh, moving on to the next issue, but it is Patrick makes a valuable point that this, this is Darren Bailey's party. We're going to see how it plays out. Um, we had mentioned Terry Bryant's race earlier. And I want to kind of dive into that a little bit because I think Wesley Cash had a lot more of an issues to run against with, with Terry Bryant than maybe B Bailey had to run against uh, Boss. Because what Cash was able to tie Bryant to things like increases in the motor fuel tax and some of the other, um, some of the teachers union stuff. Did he do it effectively? No, but he seemed to have a little bit more, a better argument if he chose to make it. Um, he still got completely blown out, about a 70 to 30 margin. So, I mean, Michael, you're in that region. I know John was down there a lot. Um, what's the takeaway from, from Brian's race with her, her mandate over here? Yeah, I think I, that on um, this race, like quality was a big factor. Um, you know, Wesley was just not the kind of candidate that was gonna, he didn't really have a path from the beginning. I mean, obviously he had financial resources. They sent out nine mailers and, and that kind of stuff, but like, he wasn't the kind of candidate that could go out to a chicken and beer dance or a pancake breakfast and shake hands and went over people. Um, and he just didn't seem to get the traction. Anyone yeah. who dumps $300,000 into your account before the campaign has even started has yeah. a path to victory. And, and Brian has weaknesses. And, and we, we certainly know that the tax votes uh, and the, and the pro union stuff is, is going to, to struggle, especially in that that electorate, uh, we talked about the crazy embrace of today's Republican Party. Cash was a terrible candidate. He was a weird guy, and even Bailey's people who came in late and tried to save him couldn't do that uh, because it was it was he was a lost cause from the start. Yeah, I think, you know, Wesley Cash, right, Patrick, was just a terrible candidate. You know, we talked about those Facebook posts before where people are complaining about him coming to their door, calling him a rhino if you're not going to vote for him. Like, I just think that, you know, he was a bad candidate who ran a terrible race. Um, you know, and I think that the Senate Republicans, let's give them credit, they got out in front of this and they were up on TV doing digital radio mail really early. And they did a great job at defining Terry Bryant as a conservative fighter for Southern Illinois. Um, they, you know, cash had a lot of money to start, but Terry ended up having more money than Wesley by the end of this thing. 
Um, you know, so I give them a lot of credit for taking this race seriously um, and putting a lot of time and effort into it, which ultimately led to Terry blowing this guy out of the water. Yeah, I think quality of campaign and quality of candidate really came, it really came down to the issue. I think if you had a better candidate with a better messaging strategy, um, that a, a candidate against Bryant certainly would have gotten close or even won, considering perhaps that, having Darren Bailey's coattails in this type of race. That didn't happen. Um, and the Senate Republicans and everybody in the state need to be thankful that it didn't happen. Um, but it certainly goes to show that candidate quality matters. So um, if the Freedom Caucus is smart, they'll start thinking about, you know, candidate quality and these sort of things. But I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, moving on, speaking of terrible campaigns, let's talk about um, the 102, District 102's write-in campaign. Um, this is a stupid campaign, not only because the IEA didn't want a good one. This is a stupid campaign because it deals with write-ins only, which is never fun. Um, this is a race I know Patrick's been looking, uh, watching pretty closely. Um, it seems like Adam Nienberg has pulled this off pretty significantly. 84 to 16 is the numbers that we're having right now. Um, Patrick, what are your takeaways? Well, uh, clearly the the numbers are heavily in favor for Nienberg. I think I've even had it. I think Yappingham County made the victor made the uh, made the the swath even bigger uh after those votes came in on on thursday and so nemerg's gonna sail but but if you look at the way the iea uh the illinois education association ran these races uh in in the 102nd and the 110th against will Auer and against nemerg and and i you know i worked for jim acklin in 2016 when he ran for state rep and and lost um and, and know him love him think the world of him they ran a bad race bad race and i don't i don't think the iea knows how to work how a message in a republican primary and and unless they're going to start making moves with strategists and and messaging that works in 2024 they're going to continue to get bulldozed and and at what point are they just wasting their money well patrick i think part of it has to do with the funding source to which these two candidates, you know, Ackland, same thing for Matt Hall, got their money. You know, I didn't think the ads were terrible. You know, I thought they painted them as conservatives. The attack ads were decent. But I think, you know, like you hinted on, voters down there, especially in that eastern part of the state, are just so conservative that, you know, they don't need Freedom Caucus doesn't need to have a lot of money to point out the fact that this is coming from Chicago woke teachers unions. And that kills these candidates on arrival. Yeah, I think that the strategy that the IEA started with Matt Hall's race was actually pretty decent. You paint him as conservative, pro-life, pro pro Second Amendment. It was a smart, it was a smart messaging at first. But that messaging only works if you know Will Howard did nothing. If Will Howard would have just ignored them and said nothing about them, then they probably would have gotten close in this race. But that's never gonna happen. It's never gonna happen that an incumbent state representative is gonna sit back and take whatever you're throwing at him. Even with Will Howard's limited resources, he was still able to get out a message that my opponent's money comes from the teachers' unions from Chicago, and that's the only message he needed to, sp to spread, and he spread it, and it worked. So the IEA's really got to start thinking to themselves, A, do I want to be playing in um, Republican primaries this, this effectively? B, do I want to play them in downstate at all? They might just want to start playing them in the suburbs, if anything. Um, and, and C, if they're going to do this, they're actually going to have to bring on Republicans to do this, like consultants and people who are in touch with the Republican Party, operatives from down there. Because if you just try and do everything on your own, it's never going to work because they have a one track mind. What might work in a Democratic primary isn't going to work in a, in a Republican primary. I know this very well, of course. So the IEA has really got to get out in front of this and say, we got to start working together with people, got to start building something long term if they're going to keep playing in Republican primaries downstate. Well, but and it I wouldn't have been. I think difficult. it was so much more than that, though. It was so much more than that. I, the the hundred and second race specifically, they ran antiquated TV ads, doing attack ads in a write-in race, not encouraging people to get out and vote for their guy, but they had no ground game. There, there are three thousand teachers in that district. They didn't mobilize them to go out and knock on doors and and work to actually win that race. They didn't pay door knockers. They, they ran a completely over the air football race with an antiquated strategy from 2000 and, and didn't actually pay attention to how you're going to win this race. And they did the same thing in, in, in the 110th, their digital strategy was awful. 
you I, i've only, i've taken you know I've, I've had candidates that have taken some some union money and teachers union money in the past and i've always said you can you can explain teachers union money as long as you're using it you know and, and i'd rather have it than not have it and and it, it was just two incredibly poorly run campaigns well i think you know we talked about it previously on other podcasts like at the very beginning they did this campaign that was they had an ad that was very i thought was pretty well done where they were saying, you know, there's no Republican candidate on the ballot. You need to write in Jim Ackland so the Democrats can't steal the seat. They should have kind of maintained that messaging paired with like a legitimate field program. And I think this race would have been a lot closer. Um, like Patrick said, I mean, if you're attacking Adam Niemerg the entire time, like all you're doing is driving his name ID up. And he was able to get some of that messaging out about, you know, the woke teachers union is funding my opponent. Um, I think, you know, if IEA wants to play down here in the future, they need to be setting up, you know, different, like a pack that they funnel that money through where, you know, the connection isn't direct. I mean, you're writing a check directly from IEA's pack to the candidate. I mean, that that's a strike against them from the beginning, especially down here. So there are a number of other primaries that took place across Southern Illinois. Um, some of the big ones are the Dave Severin, Angela Evans primary, where Dave Severin pulled out a two to one victory. Um, Brad Hallbrook and Marshall Webb, that was another two to one victory for the incumbent Brad Hallbrook. And the other main one was uh, House District 88, Reagan Deering's um, trouncing of Chuck Erickson uh, with 68 percent of the vote. Um, a lot of different, you know, aspects of a lot of these races. Um, it seems like the only it, well, let me rephrase that. Um, it seems like Deering might be the most, you know. That was the most obvious answer. Um, she had the most resources. She had the most money. Erickson really had to lean on McLean County, and that really didn't come through. Um, but in general, you know, what some takeaways we want to see from the Severin race and from the rest of these races? I mean, yeah, I would I'm say, like, sorry, go ahead, Patrick. You go for the Severn race is, is the Bryant race part two, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. with a, so. except that, except that cash had some early money that he didn't spend that, that Evans never had. I mean, a terrible candidate, terrible backing, terrible strategy, racist radio ad, you know, endorsements from cross burners, uh, not a, not a professional operation. And, and you're rarely going to find campaigns that, that are not professional operations that win. And, and that's what it comes down to. And, you know, you, you, we, Severin probably had weakness. I think there were, there are places he can be tagged in a Republican primary, but, but if you don't find a good, well-funded, well-versed, strong candidate with a decent organization, they will never win. Yeah. And I think, you know, Dave ran a really good race um, and put a lot of emphasis to on field. Like they were knocking doors on that Eastern part of the state where that's a little bit of a Bailey stronghold. They spent time, you know, in these counties over there and in these, you know, towns really talking about his message and just separating him from Angela, because you are right, Patrick, Angela ran a terrible race. You know, she wasn't out knocking doors. It seemed like her mail wasn't very good. She relied on the Restore Illinois Pack to come in for her, and they came in way too late at the point where you're just not going to penetrate a message. And, you know, let's give House Republicans credit here where they did a great job of getting out in front of this. They were in mailboxes early. They were doing digital early. They were doing radio early, and they were defining Dave how they wanted to define him. So by the time Angela even has any money to come in, you know, Dave's already defined in voters' minds. They know Dave as a Southern Illinois conservative who's fighting for their values in Springfield. And at that point, it doesn't matter what Evan says because it's just way too late in the game. Yeah, and I think if you look at kind of that race over the course, you know, from January until March 19th, like early on, Angela was just kind of wandering aimlessly. She didn't really know what she was doing. They weren't, you know, putting up door numbers they had no mail until you know really the last two weeks and the mail that they did have um two out of the three were just anti severin and then there was one contrast mailer i mean they did not get her name id up people didn't know who she was and dave severin was hit the ground running and was just working it tirelessly all the way through um and i think if like uh, jonathan said those eastern counties i mean there was a lot of people that voted for Darren Bailey and voted for Dave Severin. Um, and that's a big deal and a big testament to the work that that campaign put in because 
you know, Angela should have been getting a lot of those Darren Bailey voters, um, and she just didn't. And that seems to be the current, the running theme of yours, quality of campaign. I think if Evans would have had the money that Wesley Cash had and kind of ticketed up with Darren Bailey in some of those eastern counties, this could have been a much closer race. I don't know if Evans wins it, considering some of the rhetoric she was putting out there, but certainly this was a this was a race that they could have gotten closer to, but the money just wasn't there. The campaign infrastructure just wasn't there. Um, and it's the same same kind of goes for Chuck Erickson in, in 88. You know, Erickson didn't really have a campaign infrastructure. I mean, Reagan Deering had everything. She had Calkins endorsement. She had, you know, a lot of part, a lot of party support outside of McLean County. Uh, she had, you know, outside spending coming in for her. This was just an this was just a total wash on Chuck Erickson, who was probably to the le left of Reagan in this race, but just didn't run a very effective campaign here. So really, it's a lot of it's a lot of critiques on campaign this cycle. Is if you're going to take out if you're going to take out somebody, if you're going to be the underdog in a race, you better put together a strong campaign strategy or else you're just not going to come even close. And, and as we're seeing, when AFP comes in with, with tens of thousands of dollars in the mail that's going untouched from from other, you know, other candidates who don't have that money, uh, they're they're getting a one-sided narrative out there. And it helped Deering, it helped Balcoma, it helped a couple of folks. Well, and there was a there was an opening for some of these people that were not backed by AFP to say, you know, hey, AFP, that's like a Nikki Haley, never Trump organization. I mean, they poured, you know, mil millions and millions of dollars to backing Nikki Haley. And that could have been that AFP endorsement totally have been used against people. But it really wasn't. Nobody really even, you know, broached that topic. Um, do we want to move on to the Halbrook one? Because I know that Patrick's got some uh, some hot takes on that race. Well, no, I think it's just interesting that Brad Halbrook loses his home county yeah. in, in a in a rep primary and manages to win. I mean, that's I, I wouldn't call that a hot take. I would just call it an For observation. Sure. And yeah. and it's but I mean it 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 shows you that I mean one Shelby County is the dumpster fire uh, for anyone that, that's paid any attention to what's going on down there. But uh, but Halbrook made a term limit pledge, and that was that was Webb's point in the whole thing, and and it. It maybe didn't resonate enough, but uh, there there is weakness there for Halbrook if he gets a real challenger down the road, maybe maybe in 26. Well, and then you look at Christian County. I mean, they had a contested circuit clerk race. Um, Halbrook kind of inserted himself in that and even did some text messages and stuff like that for um, one of the candidates, and she lost 70-30. Um, um, so, yeah, there. Halbrook really needs to look over those numbers, see where his problems are, and kind of work to address those, especially if he wants to continue, you know, representing that district. If Rodney Davis puts an organization behind somebody down there, it could be a real race. Yeah. So moving on from the sunny skies of Southern Illinois, moving back up to where I live and something I could talk about maybe in more depth, we're going to talk about the Cook County State's Attorney's race next. Now, as of the last counting in the ballots, Burke has, Burke has maintaining a slim lead of about 8,300 votes. There are still, as of the last time I checked, things may have changed by the time you're watching this, there are still 11 precincts outstanding in the city of Chicago, um, mainly concentrated in the, in the city's south and west side, which seemed to favor Clayton Harris. Um, the city of Chicago's election authority put out yesterday that they have about 65,000 mail-in ballots they still have to count. Now, I don't know. We don't know exactly where those are going to go, but we can expect they're going to favor Clayton Harris. Um, it seems like the both the Chicago board and the Cook County clerk are going to count most of these ballots on Friday. Um, so we should know where this race is by tomorrow or by the time you're watching this video. Um, as of right now, if there truly are 65,000 ballots that are going to be counted um, from Chicago and suburban Cook, that's a benefit for Harris. The more ballots come in, the less of a percentage she has to win of the vote. So right now, I'm confident in saying, I'm fairly confident in saying, I think Harris is going to eke this out. But Burke's team, team seems pretty confident. So um, what, do, what do you guys have to think say about this? I'm so flummoxed by Cook County at this point. I have no idea what to think. I mean, you see the the progressive revolution that, that, that came to the city in, in 2023 by by electing a mayor who has essentially been a, a disaster and, and, you know, they, they go progressive in a lot of these races uh, like circuit clerk, like that 20th Senate district, they go as progressive as possible. 
though that is the most liberal Senate district in the state. And then you're you're neck and neck with with the state's attorney race. And and it's it's a uh, it's a question of what was the Fox effect? What was the party effect? You know, I live in the suburbs and and Burke had no presence here uh, in, in suburban Cook. And and I wondered what the hell she was doing. Uh, you know, there it looked like they were banking on on the lakefront vote to get her through. And that's not nearly enough when. Kim Fox was repeatedly getting creamed in the suburbs. So so why not lean on that? It, it just seems like political malfeasance if she manages to lose this race. Yeah, and the fact, though, to be said, I've been making fun of Burke's abortion-first messaging since this campaign started. It was inconceivable to me that they were rolling with the abortion message in a state's attorney's race when when you're running for judge, you can roll the abortion message. Voters know to attribute the to com combine the judiciary and abortion because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. People understand it. But with the state's attorney's office, there's not really a direct link there other than it's a legal office. Um, so I really didn't understand why the Burke campaign was pushing so hard. But judging from the results that are coming in from the city of Chicago's precincts right now, it does seem like they did get a number of votes along the lakeshore with that strategy. So for that, I will give them credit. At the same time, I'm going to agree with Patrick. Had they did, had they targeted this properly, used their abortion-first messaging along that, that lakeshore, and used the crime-first messaging in Patrick's area and my area, this race would have been over by now. She'd be at a 18,000 vote um, lead right now, if not more. That would have been much easy, much harder for Harris to overcome. Instead, they rolled with a, unif uh, a unified message of abortion until the very end, started trickling in some crime messaging, and then got this close by pure voters knew what they were doing, which I was very surprised. You're looking at Burke at 95%, some, some of the precincts by me. That I, is I, fantastic, and I'm glad she did that. But this could have been better had she actually drove people out with some grassroots, some field, and it doesn't seem like she did that. I talked about it on this show last week, that that she needed to make a conscious effort to explain that she was the uh, the candidate that was the opposite of Kim Fox on prosecuting gun crimes. And it's like someone was listening because she made a tweet about it like the very next day. Uh, yeah. Like if you if you commit a gun crime, you're you're going to prison. Uh, so you're welcome. I'll send you the bill, Burke campaign, <laughs> uh, for that messaging strategy. Uh, but it, it, the the write in or the uh, the mail in ballot question is is going to be really interesting because now that we have so many like universal vote by mail at this point, the the people that are just permanently getting it, it's not the same demographic that it was six or eight years ago that would be you would think more liberal more progressive now it's just kind of everybody is yeah. doing it and 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 so people can talk like they're confident at what's out there in, in mail-in ballot but i don't think anybody really knows what's going on until until we see them come in i still think the the evidence is baked in from Vallis's race. Now, obviously, we're dealing with Cook County instead of in addition to Chicago, not just Chicago here. But Vallis lost a solid two to three percent after the mail started coming in after the election. It was much closer election night than what the result actually turned out for him. And I'm expecting something similar to happen here for Harris. I think completely different I, electorate, though. Completely different electorate. I don't think so. I think it's a very similar electorate because it, all you're really taking out of this electorate is the hardcore Republicans who decided to vote for Vallis in the 2023 Chicago mayoral election. You got a lot of moderate that. suburban moms out there who are pulling Democratic ballots these days because they're scared to death of Donald Trump. And and I'll bet you that they, they're they they're voting but, for, for Burke before they're voting for Harris. And, but and even, even still, there's a math problem here, Patrick, because there, there, there are going to be, more, there are more, based on the numbers I've gotten, um, there are more mail-in ballots that are going to come out of the city of Chicago than there are going to be in suburban Cook. So even if Burke somehow wins, you know, the outstanding mail-in ballots in suburban Cook, which I will concede is possible, maybe if not probable, um, but there's still going to be a, a disproportionate, you know, there's going to be more in Cook in Chicago than there is going to be in Cook Co County, suburban Cook County. So that's going to benefit Harris. I still think Harris has the edge in this race, judging on how many ballots are going are coming in at this point. 
I'm 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 just saying I don't know. I don't know what it looks like in, in, in the vote by mail, but but I would say that the difference is that you had such a progressive push in the city in 2023. It we thought going into this primary that there would be that big progressive push. I think that bring home Chicago transfer tax referendum uh, kind of tells you differently of what the electorate actually looked like in the city because your super liberals don't care that their rent would go up because they're going to give somebody a tent to live in. You know, it it it, it wasn't it, it wasn't based in reality. So to me, the the result of that referendum shows me that 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 the electorate is going to be stronger for Burke in in the big picture, which I think usually would show itself in a, in, in mail-in ballots, but it's really, again, it's just, we don't know because there are so many more Cook County residents that are doing the, the permanent vote by mail that, that, that never would have eight or 10 years ago that we don't know what this is going to look like. Well, I, I, I think the, I don't know answer is certainly the optimistic answer in this, in this uh, discussion. Um, the thing I'll say on the bring Chicago home, I think Patrick makes a great point. You know, the, the super progressives don't care if the rent's going to go up, but the reason why they don't care if the rent's going to go up is because the super progressives are having their rent paid for by their mothers and fathers who live in Naperville or you know, <laughs> out in Aurora or Barrington or something like that while they're living in a two flat in Logan Square. So, of course, they don't care if the rent goes up. Um, but even so, I mean, this, this was the Bring Chicago Home specifically. That was a rejection of Brandon Johnson. That, that That's pure and simple what it was. If if Lori Lightfoot tried to do this, I think it would have won. It would have been close, don't get me wrong. But I don't think Johnson's as hated as someone like Lightfoot or Rom or or Daly or any of these people were. But because Johnson's approval ratings are in the tubes right now, people are thinking to themselves, yes, perhaps I do want to help the homeless. But do I want to put the Johnson administration in charge of the uh, helping the homeless? Hell no. Because Lord knows that money's not going to be going to actually help the homeless. It's going to go to some bureaucracy or some nonprofit, and the money's going to go nowhere. And all I just raised my taxes for nothing. Well, and that was the that was part of the issue of the messaging was it was it was the feel good stuff, but there was no there was no meat behind it. All they had to do was was ease some voters' concerns by saying, "Here's how we're going to tax the ultra rich." you know, the J.B. Pritzkers, the big apartment managers, et cetera, et cetera. And here are the programs that we are specifically going to fund. And they did a terrible job at that. And BOMA and Realtors did a really great job of uh, of, of coming out and and raising the issues with with that referendum. And 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 yeah, Johnson's numbers had a lot to do with it. And 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 everyone who's looking at that that mayoral administration with an objective eye now that we see thursday the only insider in the uh the administration is running for the hills that that everyone is looking at that and seeing it's an abject failure well yeah, and i also get... think you know the fact that it was like on the ballot off the ballot back on like that kind of caught some people off guard and there was probably some missed opportunities on on both sides of the equation as a result of that kind of court battle over it the reason why it was kicked off the ballot was why I was so confident it was going to actually win. Because after it got re, because even after it got kicked off the ballot, um, Jackson Potter and the CTU said we're not going to stop. We're still going to push. We're even if, if if this is illegal, we're not going to stop winning a re referendum. And it seemed like after it got reinstatement re reinstated, there was a a slowdown in the opposition. For even if it was only for a few days. It seemed like the op the opponents of the referendum needed a second to recollect themselves because they didn't actually expect it to be reinstated. So there was that slowdown that made me believe that it was going to get through. But certainly, I think that the messaging as a whole, you know, do you trust Brandon Johnson with your money? Phenomenal messaging on their end. It ended up working. And if only there was that good of messaging on Burke's campaign, because we would be happy about that right now instead of hopefully – maybe not knowing where these mail-in ballots. Not only did I think it was going to win, I thought it was going to win huge, which which just shows how surprised I am at the final result. See, I don't know. It, I, I never knew thought it was going to be close. I thought it was it was a more localized issue. It wasn't like the progressive tax, which was statewide. You can't, you know, whenever you hyper-focus um, an issue on a certain ge geographical area, it's always going to be closer than it was if it was a larger scale um, question. Yeah, um, but, but essentially still, like, in the city, you're starting with an 80 percent Democrat advantage, you know, 80, 80, 20 Democrat advantage in the city. So so you, you're essentially having to peel off 30 points just to beat it. 
And and I didn't know that they were going to be able to do that, especially with uh, with with the crowded media market, the the tough, the hard time it was to break through on the issue. So I just thought people saw help the homeless and they were going to do it. But uh, but but clearly, you know, I I was wrong. And, and so were a lot of folks. And like I said on, on Tuesday night, you know, a lot of people are associating the migrant crisis with homelessness right now in the city of Chicago. And for better or for worse, that's what people are associating it with. So I think that also had part of it because the migrant crisis is being handled so poorly by the administration, by all parties involved. People thought of that in their minds. And I think that's why it did fairly decently in some black neighborhoods, because you'd think that the black demographic would be so pro, pro whatever the most democratic messaging is. And Honestly, it seems like the Bring Chicago Home was opposed more than Burke was supported, which is certainly interesting. So moving on from only Chicago, unfortunately, and Cook County stuff, uh, we're going to kind of go back to general questions for November. Um, and now we can easily see that Donald Trump's going to be the Republican nominee. I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry, Patrick. Your girl, Nikki Haley, didn't pull it through. We've known this for a while now. Um, <laughs> she wasn't was my girl. Mind? She was just the anybody but Trump option. And if, that guy if, sucks be, out loud. Be that as it may, we now need to begin talking about, because it's after March 19th, we now have to start talking about November. So with Trump being the nominee, and it seems like Trump perform, Trump adjacent candidates performing very well cr across the state, what is this going to look like come November with Trump being on the top of the ticket? How are we looking statewide? Well, I think if you're in the suburbs, you need to start now, you know, working to, you know, I'm basically separate yourself from like Trumpism as much as possible, because like Trump's problem in the suburbs, I feel like it's really a like personality problem. It's, it's not necessarily, you know, lower taxes, immigration and like a policy problem. He's got a personality problem. He has a January 6th problem. And he has an abortion problem because, you know, it's a criminal charges problem. And that, too, I think because despite you know what how popular that stuff might be in Republican primaries and they don't care about it, suburban independent voters do care about that. They care about, you know, this idea of like a threat to democracy. They want to know where you stand on abortion, you know, and Republicans, I think, need to do a good job of trying to localize these races as much as possible. You know, what are the issues that are happening in House District 45 that Rebeletti can really start to localize on and make that the narrative and theme throughout his entire campaign and just not get, you know, sucked into this idea that Dennis Rebeletti is a Trump loving MAGA Republican because that's not who he is. And he just needs to work to make sure that's not how he's defined. Well, well and and Rebeletti is a good example because he's already <laughs> taken abortion off the table. Uh, for 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 the Democrats in that race. So though personal pack, I'm sure will find some way to come in and, and you know, accuse him of of not being pro choicey enough. But uh, but but yeah, I mean, if I'm if I'm doing mail in that district, I'm, I'm calling Marty McLaughlin, you know, MAGA Republican, Trump Republican. I'm doing that to Rebeletti. I'm doing that to Nicole Laha. I'm doing that to to every single suburban Republican on a ballot in November. Amy Grant, for sure. Grant's super vulnerable. You know, Republicans are defending seven seats that Joe Biden won. And I think six of them are in the suburbs. So so it's or five of them, at least, because I think Greenwood. Uh, yeah, Greenwood yeah. was the Greenwood district was also Biden. So it's it's Greenwood and and um, Schweizer, which was the former Marin seat. Uh, so five of them are in the suburbs. So every single one of those, I mean, Marty McLaughlin posting stupid selfies with election denying loons like Mike Lindell does not win you a race. I'll bet you that mail's already drafted and ready to drop sometime in October. Absolutely. I think you guys are right, though. I think you got to just get out in front of it. You got to have responses to a lot of these questions ironed out. And, you know, whenever these issues come up, whether it's abortion or Trump, et cetera, like you have you have to be prepared and stick to that message. Like somebody had House Republicans, Senate Republicans, they need to be doing message testing in a lot of these counties and saying, OK, like this is what you need to say whenever somebody asks you what you think about you know, Roe versus Wade getting overturned. What do you think about Donald Trump? What do you think about January 6th? Like you have to have answers. You can't, the, la the last election cycle pro kind of proved it. And a lot of these 
northern areas where people just said, oh, well, I'm just not even going to talk about abortion whatsoever. Or I'm just going to pretend Trump doesn't exist. Well, that's voters want to know. They want to know what you think on these issues. And if you don't have a response, then they're going to just assume that, oh, well, what the Democrats said your your position was, that, well, that must be true. As I've been saying for weeks now, anybody who tells you House, De- House Republicans are on the offense and not on defense is lying to themselves. So the House Republicans specifically need to come out with a plan of what are we going to say to the Trump question? They're defending all these suburban seats. They have to find an answer to the abortion question. Rebel Eddie seems to be out in front of it, so good for him. But for the rest of their candidates in seats like 52, which is Marty McLaughlin, 51, which are trying to take back, they need to come up with answers to the abortion question now and to the Trump question, or else, I mean, I think these races are all toast. Um, but it, they could still have a chance that they come out with some messaging now and get out ahead of it. But We'll see if that actually ends up happening. I mean, if um, I'm if I'm running Rebel Eddie's race, the first mail piece I'm putting out is here are some truths. Trump lost in 2020. Abortion should be legal. Just put the list down. Just of all the things that you need to make sure is on paper that that moderate and independent voters in that district need to see right away, so that they they get some sense that Dennis Rebeletti or Nicola Ha or Marty McLaughlin, who's not taking that advice for sure, are mm-hmm. are going to listen to uh, and, and and not write them off as some loony ass Republican because I that's think- what this about that's what suburban voters look at Republicans at today as 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 acolytes of Trump and that's not going to win up here. I well, think- and you also have to make sure that that mail is like hyper targeted. You don't want to be sent. I, there's people that support Trump that oh, live no, in that district course. and you need their vote. You have to target that to the people that, you know, maybe you're on the fence and they're like, well, maybe I won't vote at all, or maybe I won't vote for you because I think you're MAGA. Well, like, you, you still got to target, tell them the target, truth. Target, that, target. That you still got to tell them the truth that the 2020 election was not stolen. I mean, even, even Republicans need to hear that message right now. Yeah, well, but you don't want to poke somebody in the I mean, I get what you're saying, but you also don't want to like needlessly poke somebody in the eye and then they not vote for you. I, I think I think the poke somebody I think might apply to the abortion. I don't think it applies to the Trump lost thing. I, I think even Trump supporters, most of them at least are willing to concede the in that district are willing to concede the fact that Trump lost and Biden's the president at this point. I don't think you lose much with that. Um, but with the abortion, but Trump's going to continue to deny the results of the election all through November. They're going to have to hear it from a moderate, sane Republican because Trump still won't admit it. And he's still fighting it. And well, I think- I'm, I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing with you, Patrick. I just don't I, I don't think that's going to take away votes from the, the far right the same way. Maybe if you because the pro-lifers, if you you know, it's the same thing with Pat Brady pack. If you disagree with them on one issue, you're going to, you know, get all your money, all their money thrown at you. So you have to. Well, Pro-lifers don't have money, but you still want to make sure you don't make an enemy out of them because that's just not how this works. So I would reach out to them and then start hyper-targeting. John, what were you going to say? And then we're going to start closing down. Yeah, I was just going to say, I agree with Patrick, though. Like, you know, you have to do work with these independent voters and let them know that you are just not, a, you know, some MAGA-loving Trump supporter. Because at the end of the day, you know, you might annoy a Republican, but push comes to shove. They're going to vote for you. They're going to come home like they do every cycle. And I think like you know, these independent voters are where we really need to be spending our time and energy and do everything we can to get out in front of the onslaught of Democratic TV, mail and texting that's going to accuse every single one of our candidates of, you know, basically just being the devil who want to take away your rights and burn down democracy. Like we just got to get out ahead of that. And if we do, we can be successful at the state level because in 2020, we picked up a seat, you know, uh, we can overcome some of these things if we just have a good message and really work to overcome that onslaught of negative messaging that's coming. I would agree. So I, we're well past our time limit for today. And Lane's already about to kill me that I just made more work for him because uh, it was supposed to be a half hour. I think we're on minute 50. So I'm just going to open up real quick. Final thoughts, be it politically or otherwise of this election. Uh, Michael, you go first. Uh, I don't know. I think that, you know, overall, Tuesday night was a good night. And a lot of the people that needed to win were successful, um, you know, with a few exceptions. And now it's just, you know, let's all come back together and focus on this November election and see what we can do. Patrick, your final thoughts. It's going to be a long year. (laughs) It's going to be a long year. We've got ugly, mean-spirited, 
really tough races coming at us from all directions and all corners of the state from yeah. from the 114th to the 76th to the 52nd in the house not so much in the senate and, and you know maybe that 17th congressional gets gets on a national stage and then of course we're just going to have all the toxicity on the national stage i'm i would rather just like burrow down in the ground for the next eight months than than have to deal with some of this john do you have any positive notes to leave us on uh, I think, you know, the election day is a really long ways away. Everyone's going to want to talk about what's going to be important now and the things that are going to matter. But in reality, we don't even know what the most important issue is going to be. I mean, Roe v. Wade, you know, overturned in the middle of the summer. We all thought it was going to be about the economy. That election changed on a dime. You know, I think the most important thing is to just be ready for whatever comes and have responses ready. Well, thank you all for being with us today. My final thoughts are send your energy to the Eileen O'Neill Burke poll watchers and Cicero in the city of Chicago right now. Send your energy to Patrick just in case Illinois manages to lose tonight. Um, oh God, and send your cry. energy to John so that Northwestern wins because I have them in my bracket. This is. And John also, D. let's, if you don't mind, let's uh, let's uh, wish, give our best wishes to Colin and Abby as we're expecting their uh, their baby boy any minute now. And uh, we're, we're our thoughts and prayers are definitely with them. Indeed. Absolutely. Well, once again, this is Jonathan Gieske, Michael Butler, Patrick Finkston, and me, Chris Jakowiak, t- telling you farewell and have a wonderful weekend.